Well, good evening, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brother Levi Myers, and Sister and Amanda and I transferred to the Cambridge meeting um, just before COVID happened. And before I got started, I just wanted to say how incredibly thankful we are to be a part of the Cambridge meeting and how we have felt so warmly received into the meeting and we're just so thankful for all of you because um, at a time like this, it could be really hard to integrate into a meeting, but we felt like um, very warmly welcomed. So it's been very much appreciated. So thank you for that. Let me ask you a question as we start. In your life, have you ever wished that you could make a significant spiritual change? Have you ever wished that you could be a better person? Maybe there's a certain sin that you struggle with and it's a sin that you feel like it's not just a one-time thing. It's, it's a struggle that ensnares you again and again and again. Has any of you ever felt that way? I know I have. It's almost a feeling like you're trapped like you're chained to your sinful ways with, with seemingly no escape. So the question is, is there a way of escape? And how can we be set free? How can we get that, that way of escape? So today we're going to lay the foundation for how we can do just that, how we can break free from that sin, those, those types of sins that, that, that we struggle with and that feeling that we get when we have those sins that make us feel trapped and, and stuck. We're going to tackle how we can break free. And uh, one of the most important verses from tonight comes from John, and it's from John chapter 8. And um, John chapter 8 and verse 31 to 38. And uh, I'll just read that. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. And they answered him, we are the offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it you say that we will become free? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And so this is a beautiful passage that gives us really the answer right off the bat to how we can be made free. And that simple answer is the answer of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we started with a, a chapter in, in Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 1 we are given a question right off the start. That question is, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So if there is an answer to these sins that ensnare us and we can be set free from that, should we then continue in sin? But we're going to also look at that question tonight. But before that, let's rewind to Romans chapter 5 to truly get a picture of exactly... Um, how we can break free from sin. Romans chapter 5, the, the chapter before Romans chapter 6, we read about in Romans chapter 5 how we can be we can be made right with God through one man's act of righteousness, one man's act of obedience. And so in verse in verse chapter um 12 of Romans chapter 5, it says, through one man, sin entered the world and continued 
uh, in verse, skipping down now to verse 18, it says, therefore, by, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to come in condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, many shall be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And so the law comes in in verse 20. And we see everywhere that we fall short as humans. All the sins that we're talking about, those things that we struggle with, those things that trap us. But then, continuing on, it says that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so what we see here is that where we have sin, there's an opportunity for much more grace. God has more grace than we have sin. God has more, God has more forgiveness than we have disobedience. Actually, Psalm 103 touches on this concept. Psalms chapter 103. So if we can just turn there. Psalms chapter 103, and we're going to look at verse 9. Speaking of God. He will not always chide. Neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. It says, as far as the east is from the west, in verse 12, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And so we start to see this beautiful picture in scripture of grace. And honestly, it's something that on a personal level, I have struggled with a lot to understand. Because especially when I was younger, I, I had, I guess I'd been given the idea or I, I had taken on the idea myself that um, grace is not somehow easy to attain or it's hard to forgive someone who's, who's so sinful or, you know, how, how can I, um, how can, how can I get into the kingdom when there's so many things that we can do wrong and we keep doing them and we're supposed to do good things, but we keep doing bad things. I've struggled with that as a, as a concept to understand how we can, can make it to the kingdom. It seems like maybe it seems like there's this laundry list of things that we can't do and things that we can do and we struggle so much and it seems almost impossible. I don't know if you felt like that, but this concept of grace is a concept that blows my mind. Because it takes all that and it says, no, it's not about, it's not about the, the fact that we sin. It's about the fact that we do our best. It's about the fact that we try. It's about the fact that where we do sin, if we're willing to seek God, he offers us more grace than we have sinned. And nothing can separate us in Romans chapter 8, um, verse 38 to 39. It says, from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so God can take, God can take the most radical sinner, the most sinful of sinners, 
and give them forgiveness. For example, we think of David's sin with Bathsheba, both adultery and murder. Saul breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the ecclesia before he came Paul before he became Paul. And so where does this leave us in regards to sin? Because this is such an exciting concept. This, this means that we can be set free. This means that this concept of grace allows us peace of mind. And so the question arises that we read in Romans chapter 6, does it even matter if we sin? Romans 6 verse 23 actually gave us that answer. So it gives the answer in, in that same chapter. I'm just going to flip back to Romans in my Bible here. Um, I'm 100% not going to follow my slides because uh, I've already gotten like four or five behind, I think. Romans chapter 6, in verse 23, we get the answer. Should we continue in sin? If we're given grace, and grace is this amazing concept where it's, it's like God hardly even remembers our sin as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed that sin from us? Well, then it's a logical question. Why can't we just sin? Because it seems like that makes sense. Well, Romans 6 gives us the answer in verse 23 where it says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus. And so the answer in Romans 6 and verse 1 is, 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 is actually given there. It says, certainly not. Shall we continue in sin that grace may amount? Certainly not. Because the wages of sin is death. Sin is bad. Don't do it. And it leads to death. And so there's a three-step process that we go through as believers. We, when we enter into this relationship with God, the first is outlined in Romans chapter 5, where it says that we are justified. In Romans 5 and verse 18, it says, Therefore, by, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. And so this is the process we go through, um, the process of baptism. Which, which will then continue as we, as we go on our walk. We'll continue to be justified. But after baptism, we, we now have to deal with things. We have to live life. We have to go through a process of continually cleaning ourselves from sin. And so we need to be washed from sin. And that, that, that process in scripture is called being sanctified. First Corinthians um, chapter 6 talks about uh, uh, this process of sanctified. So We'll just quickly go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and uh, verse 9. Uh, know ye not the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, adulterers, um, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, or effeminate, or abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall receive the kingdom of God. And so we have this lift, list of sin, these kinds of things that, that trap us. And such were some of you. So these people in, in the Corinthians, these, these were real people. These were people who were dealing with sin, like you and me. We struggle with sin. They struggled with sin. They felt trapped. We felt, we feel trapped at times. But it says there, uh, such were some of you, but ye are washed. It says that. It says you were sanctified. And it actually says you were justified as well. So there's that, there's that process. So justification, sanctification. And then the third, the third thing is, is glorif being glorified. It says in Romans chapter 8 um, and verse 17 that we shall be glorified or we can be glorified. And so the process that we go through is justification, sanctification, and being glorified. And so even though we're justified now, even though we are given this, this opportunity, um, we still have this battle. We still have this, this fight that we need to continue until Christ comes back. 
um, it's, it's the battle of who we were before Christ versus the battle of who we are baptized into Christ. The old man versus the new man. Death versus life in Christ. We have died to sin, but we're offered life in Christ. We're set free in Christ. And now we are baptized into his death. And so now there's this clear difference. There should be this clear difference between who we were and who we are. When we're baptized, we need to realize that we are no longer who we were. We are supposed to be a new creation. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, the old things are past, the new has come. And that's how we need to, that's that's how we need to think of ourselves. The old ways of life, they need to be put to death. We now walk in Romans 6 and verse 4, and this is a, a beautiful phrase. We need to walk in newness of life. We are now free walking in newness of life. So now we are people who are called to walk as new creations in Christ. The old has passed away and the new has come. And um, this, this process, this walk, this new creation, this walk of newness in life is described in Galatians 2 verse 20, where it says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And so we must live this new life, this new creation, this newness of life, having Christ living in us. And this means, really, that we are to try to be like him. First um, Peter uh, chapter 4, verse one, uh, 1 to 3 is uh, the next passage I want to turn up here. First Peter chapter 4. Verse 1 to 3. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath also ceased from sin that he, that he no longer should live the rest of his life uh, his time in the flesh to the lusts of men but to the will of god for in times past our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excessive wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excessive riot, speaking evil of you. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to the men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. For the end of all these things is at hand, but be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover, or love shall cover a multitude of sins. And so we are supposed to be living our life in newness of life, ceasing from sin, and following that example of Christ. And, and what was that example of Christ? Well, that example of Christ was showing love. Think of, think of how he, tr uh, he treated all of those around him. So we need to learn to walk by faith and not by sight, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7. Um, and Micah 6, verse 8, speaks about our walk as well. It says, he has showed you, O man, what is good. It says, what does the Lord require of you to do justly? to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. And so we're supposed to walk in this newness of life. And sometimes we see these verses in Romans 6 as, 
as being closely linked to baptism. And uh, what I mean by that is it is linked to baptism, but sometimes once we're baptized and we're now a believer, it becomes almost like, hey, maybe this isn't as applicable to us because this is usually a passage that's read at baptisms and it doesn't seem as applicable. Well, here's the thing. This verse is for our every, these verses are for our everyday walk. This is our walk in newness of life. We are always to be new. It's a process that we do every single day. The old is done away with from the point of baptism on. And so this process of, of newness of life and breaking free from sin, it, it happens every single day. There's no point where this finishes until that day which will come that we will be glorified and the whole earth eventually will be filled with that glory. Uh, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 to 4 says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. It's a process. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, you shall also appear with him in glory. And so we need to get that excitement that we had at baptism, we need to get that back. We need to have that always. We should feel that every day. This is not just for the newly baptized, but for all those who are baptized. We need that newness feeling. We need that feeling of freedom, that, that feeling that we get. Um, Lamentations 3, verse 22 to 23 says that God's love and compassion is new every morning. And so the question now is, if God's love and compassion is, is, is new every day for us, shouldn't our love and compassion be new for him every single day of our life? So the question now is, what does it actually look like um, to be set free from sin and to walk in newness of life? Well, Paul gives us this answer starting in, in verse 8 back in Romans chapter 6. Verse 8 in Romans 6. It says, For if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. And verse 11 tells, what we're, tells us what we're supposed to do. It says, likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so this is how we're supposed to walk in newness of life. There was that word there, that, that kind of odd word, reckon. It's a, it's a word used um, often in the UK, but it basically means to consider or to think about. And so the, 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 the uh, point of that verse is we um, need to consider ourselves dead to sin. What do we think about ourselves in Christ? Do we consider ourselves to be dead to sin? Do we think of ourselves in that way? ESV says to count ourselves. Do we count ourselves to be dead to sin? And our mindset here is important. We need to be constantly thinking of ourselves as dead to sin and what that looks like. What does it look like to be dead to sin? When we're baptized and we come up out of the water, we're still the same person. Our mind is still the same mind and our thinking is, is still the same. But we have to make a conscious effort to wrestle with our thinking every single day. We need to have this, this, this newness of thinking. We need to see ourselves at, 
as, as dead to sin and, and act as if we are. The next thing Paul tells us in verse 12 is, is do not let sin reign in your mortal body. So first we're told this, to change the way we reckon or change the way we think. Um, and then the second thing we're told is to not let sin reign in our mortal bodies. In other words, we need to fight this. We need to fight against sin in our lives. We need to look at sin as the enemy and the foe that we have to battle with every single day. And there are things in our lives that we're going to have to leave behind. Things that the world doesn't think are bad. And so there's action that, that needs to be taken. We're dead to sin now. Now we live for righteousness. We can't let these, these things reign over our lives anymore. And we need to fight them. We need to put to death the old ways and live for the new ways, that newness of life. And verse 13 says, don't be instruments to sin, but be instruments of righteousness to God. And the shift happens in the newness. The shift that happens in the newness of life isn't just putting away the old things. It's not just staying away from sin because that's not enough. It's about getting out there. It's not, it's not just about not doing bad things. It's about rolling up our sleeves and getting to work and doing, doing the work of Christ. Um, we need to be instruments working for good and not for evil. We need to be a new creation that's put to work for righteousness. If we just stood there and, 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 and went... I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to build a wall around myself. How does that put any, any action into your life? How does that put anything into practice? We need to get out there. We need to work. We need to, to show love to our neighbors, to our friends, to our families, to preach the word, to um, reach out to each other and support each other and, and do these wonderful things that that are all examples of how Christ lived and walk in that newness of life truly and not just do it in, in, in word and in deed. And so we need to work to fill the earth with God's glory, that ultimate purpose that God has for us. And it's this beautiful picture. It's a picture of a family set free from sin. How are we set free from sin? We're set free from sin through Christ and through the grace that we, we are able to receive um, from Christ. And we're a family of people who struggle with the same things, um, but we're offered that same forgiveness. And so now we need to consider ourselves as dead to sin and choose to be instruments of righteousness rather than instruments of sin. And when we're doing these things and living for God, then sin will not have dominion, as verse 14 of, of chapter 6 says. Verse 22, to walk in newness of life is to be made, uh, is to be made free from sin. That's that beautiful phrase, that, that being set free, you know, who the sun sets free is indeed free. We are indeed free. We can, we can be set free from sin um, through, the word, through the example of our Lord Jesus Christ and through what he accomplished and to follow his example and to do our best because we're not supposed to sin that grace may abound. We're supposed to consider ourselves as dead to sin because the wages of sin is death. So we don't want to keep sinning. There's action that's required, but we are offered a gift of grace. And we can't forget that. It's so easy to forget that. It's so easy to be depressed or negative or down because it seems like such a mountain that we have to climb. And it's not. That's why God has given us Christ. He's given us this example. He's given us this way to be able to receive grace. 
And so through the strength of our Heavenly Father and through the example of Christ and through the tools that God's given us, we need to, to continue this, um, this walk knowing and believing with all of our hearts that we are set free and that we are walking and able to walk and continue to walk in newness of life. And so verse 23, our original question was answered. For the wages of sin is death, right? So that's that, shall we continue in sin that grace will abound? Well, no, because that leads to death. But the free gift, and it is the gift of God, is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And it's a gift because when you're getting a gift, it's something that you don't necessarily deserve. It's something that is given to you um, because someone wants to give it to you. And that's the kind of the beautiful thing about it is God's giving us this gift of grace, this gift of Christ, this gift of eternal life. Even though we sin, even though technically on a human level, we don't deserve it to God. It's like as far as the East is from the West, he's removed our sin from us. If we're repentant, if we're walking in newness of life, if we wake up every day and consider ourselves, reckon ourselves and count ourselves to be dead to sin and to be alive and made three, free um, through Christ. And Paul wrote in prison, Philippians 3, verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting the things behind, forgetting that, that feeling of being trapped in sin, forgetting the old ways, the old man, but reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark, the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And so we too must live a newness of life now in order to live a newness of life of freedom forever and eternally in our Father's kingdom. Uh, thank you all for listening.